Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sandra Rowe and I'm the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council. I'm delighted to uh, welcome today's special guest, um, Alan Baim from uh, Procter & Gamble. He is the Chief Technology Innovation Officer with a incredible career and um, history working in um, innovation and technology. We're gonna get some thoughts from him today around some critical issues. But before we bring him on board uh, this town hall, I would like to actually read out just a few uh, bits about his background, just in case you're not so familiar with Alan. Um, Alan has over 30 years of experience in a variety of IT and business leadership roles. He has uh, been recognized both domestically and internationally for his ability to jumpstart and transform global business transformation and innovation at multiple organizations. He's currently serving as the um, CTIO, as I mentioned, at Procter & Gamble, but previously before that, he has also served as a global CTO, chief innovation officer and chief enterprise architect at the Coca-Cola company. Uh, he's also had experience on the financial services side while he was chief information, uh, sorry, head of IT strategy and architecture at ING and has also uh, been chief information officer of Juniper Networks as well as a number of other um, blue chip uh, enterprises. So there is no doubt enter, uh, Alan has a wealth of experience and we're very fortunate to have him here. Uh, Alan, if you are able to join us, we'd love to kick off with a very first, but important, I think, hello, um, critical first question, which is the role of a chief technology innovation officer. Tell us a little bit about that. What, what does that mean? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You know, I think the, um, the, the role I'll say is somewhat newish in, in, in how we, we look at things. It's, I'm always trying to look around the corner a little bit further than, than what uh, normally do. We're we very much aligned to business needs, business capabilities and market needs. But when you start looking at the role that technology is gonna play in shaping new business models, in shaping new opportunities, and how that's gonna not just transform your business today, but how that's going to transform the business in the future, it, it's very important to basically be almost part futurist, part trendsetter, and have one foot in the, in the world of pragmatism at the same time. Wow, that must be, um quite challenging to, to run something as large as P&G, but also to be thinking uh, ahead. So when you think about um, a day in the life that you have, if, do you actually even have a typical day or do you find that actually you're juggling lots of different issues at any given point? Well, I think, yeah, unfortunately, to, in, in this era, this last few months, there isn't anything that's typical. <laughs> no, there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think going forward, I mean, there's one foot in the, in the VC community, one foot in the startup community, one foot in the PE community, one foot in the uh, in the you know, in the, uh, the the corporate the enterprise community. It's almost like being an octopus. You, you probably mm. have eight arms and legs, and you're trying to look at everything simultaneously. So you you you're constantly sourcing information um, from all these different areas. What we what I have learned over the years in doing this is that the network is what's important. Mm -hmm. the, the bigger your network, the broader your network, the more that it casts, uh, the better opportunity you have to be able to see the future and understand how that can impact your business. And it's, uh, in some ways, it's actually becoming easier through the pandemic, to be honest with you. More and more people are used to using, are getting used to using Zoom and using other technologies to collaborate. You don't have to run around and do as many face-to-face -face meetings. Well, you can't in the Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, but by setting it up and just simply following the, the thing that's always been part of what's made the Silicon Valley work, which is pay it forward, take time to listen, you can easily get into a, a similar role and bring a lot of value to your company. It's interesting you say that, um, you know, this current situation has actually allowed for, um, you know, increased and easier networking. I, I agree with you. We're certainly not traveling um, like we used to. And frankly, um, that's probably not a bad thing for a carbon footprint. But uh, when you think about how um, you look at uh, your network, um, do you find that it's more organic rather than intentional, like I need to go meet with these companies or these startups? Do you find that it, it's really a more of an organic um, evolution of, of being led into other networks because you know people and et cetera, et cetera? I, I think it really is, it's organic and unintentional is, is really what happens. And that, you know, uh, if, if you're looking out for the betterment of, of everybody and of society, the betterment of your friends, betterment of, of others, 
you're always going to be willing to take a take a call. And if you take a call, that's part of the pay it forward, then someone else will take a call. I have met more interesting people from uh, leaders of nations to, uh, to sports celebrities and sports players to some of the top tech leaders, both from an engineering aspect as well as leaders of, uh, of companies and growing companies over my career. And it's the ability to go across these groups. And when you hear them say, especially from a business perspective, you're a friend of the firm, you're a friend of the company, you're a friend of mine, it, you understand what the power of networking is. And it can only happen if you have an open mind and if you're willing to share your network as well. Absolutely. And um, as I recall, Alan, I first met you with uh, Tanya, your, your senior blockchain lead, uh, in, uh, with the, in, in uh, company of uh, a sports uh, legend, um, basketball player, as I recall. Yeah, it was uh, Baron Davis. Who, uh, yeah. who uh, he and I have stayed in touch and continue to, to help each other on different things. That's great. Well, um, when we think about how much technology and innovation has changed over the decades, I mean, people are often talk about how the cycles keep accelerating or they are accelerating. Um, do you find that to be true? What if you and your career kind of gleaned from all of the technological change we've seen over the last few decades? Well, you know, I think that there's tremendous change just because the you know, compute is changing, storage is changing, and let's call it the, the basic, um, in, in chemical terms, sort of the basic molecular changes that go on is, is, is what's happening. But at the same time, the, the interesting thing about digital technologies is it's, uh, you're always taking a step backwards to go forward. And there was a, uh, a great engineer I met, and in, 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 uh, chief scientist at IBM one time, Irving Wodolsky Berger, who who put together a, a document which basically was called Back to the Future. And if you look at a lot of the trends, whether they are around distributed computing, uh, when we originally started off, we were dealing with mainframes and very centralized. We went through distributed to um, the, the system 36s and 38s. You ended up in situations with PCs, then you ended up back in these large ERP systems, which were back on prem, and then we ended up with cloud. Now we're going back pushing out to the edge and certainly blockchain plays a, a big role in this. There's a lot of lessons learned from the past. Um, even microservices, I can date that back into the, uh, into the uh, mid nineties when, when service architect, architectures from Corba and others started coming out. So, so looking at the past in order to get a view of the present and the future is always something very interesting and lets us understand how to apply things differently. And that's where the new business models and new technology advancements come from. That's an excellent point you raised that I think sometimes, um, especially those who come fresh out of school or recent grads who don't have a lot of work experience, they're um, facing problems where there's been no previous solutions. And I think uh, that's a very valuable lesson to say, we actually should look at what we've done in the past to, to um, figure out the solutions of today or tomorrow. Um, when we think about um, how big companies operate though, I mean, you have a massive, massive organization. Uh, how many people are at P&G at the moment? Several hundred thousand, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, well, in that number, yes, in that range. In that range. Um, you know, how much of that decision, there's been a trend previously around um, all outsourcing to no, to, you know, less outsourcing. Do you think in tomorrow's world, um, we're going to see a different balance come in um, regarding how much is outsourced and how much is in-house innovation. I think at P&G, we, we started that journey of, of bringing things back in two and a half years ago. And, and, um, and for 15 years, the company had outsourced everything similar to what GM had gone through, similar to what many large corporations have gone to. This mm -hmm. takes it back to a, uh, an article that was produced in the Harvard Business Review back in the, oh, I think it was the 2005, 2006. And sort of the summary on the article was, does IT matter? Right. Was the, the headline. And, and, the, and I think the, the conclusion was drawn that no, that it was more of a, a manufacturing type of a process. And therefore, uh, you ended up with, with people um, treating it as, well, we'll just get rid of it. It's something that's not value add. It's not part of our core. We should get rid of it. But, you know, but I think what we've seen since then is the, the birth of the, the data oligarchs. Mm -hmm. And we have the people like Facebook and Google and Pinterest and others, and, and certainly Amazon, that have recognized the value of the data and the data itself is what is now driving change and driving new business opportunities and models. 
model. So coming out of the 2008-2009 recession, which is actually an interesting model to look back, again, to get clues as to what might be next for us from a pandemic standpoint, as well as what, as well as what happened with the SARS virus and others previous. But looking at that, we, we find that we're going to be very data-driven for the future. The, hmm. the, there's a lot of ethical questions that are going to have to come up. Is Are people here to support the machines or do the machines support people? And are these algorithms going to be making the majority of the decisions as we go forward? So I think that we, we have this trend that is, that is changing everything that we believe in or we've known for the past, just like we're seeing our lives change. And this is going to create new opportunities for us. And we're going to see all kinds of new unicorns uh, developing out of this thing in the, in the near future. There are numerous discussions that are going on in the Silicon Valley about how this is going to impact health tech how this is going to impact med tech specifically, how this is going to impact supply chain and, and where people live. So um, yeah. at times of change, at times of create great opportunities, and I think we're all, uh, we're all going to get there. So I really appreciate your optimistic view on, on the future and, and how um, we're going to navigate and um, you know, future unicorns to be had that are not born yet. But um, when you think about a large organization, you've been to many, you've been working in many, um, what about navigating and, and being agile? How difficult, I mean, is it st like steering a gigantic oil tanker? Uh, how do you manage that division? Um, do you have any you know, instances where you, you've had uh, the ability to kind of move that dial? So I think the largest companies in the world, and some of the ones I've been with, of course, GE and Procter and & Gamble and Coca-Cola and others, what we, we tend to think of them as large companies. The reality is there's a series of companies inside of them. And, mm. and might, you might want to think of these companies as holding companies, but right. in a different way. Of course, we have multiple brands. You know, we, we have brands such as our, our fabric care product with Tide and Aria. And we have our brands in, in skin care. We have our brands and others. But within a large corporation, the, the divisions themselves operate fairly autonomously. So we have a supply chain group. We have a, a financial group, which really in many many cases acts as a finance for providing financial instruments to our our customers we have our marketing group which of course was what we're known for being one of the largest marketers in the world so you can't always believe that a, that you're you're talking about a company you have to let each group work on its own independently mm -hmm. from a technical perspective you need to provide guardrails and guidelines in which for them to operate provide them a view around the corner, if you may, because they're very much, every corporation is looking at what's next on a quarterly basis. Right. So it's really the power of the people. It's the power of the network. It's the power of the teams is what makes things great. That's why P&G does so well, is that we can test many things simultaneously. And what we try to do is get the lessons learned and take the best practices and those things that work in one area and quickly bring it to scale. And that, that's why large corporations have an advantage, those that can scale fast and those that can move around and see around the corner first. Absolutely. And um, I appreciate you kind of dissecting and unpacking that for us, that we often think of companies as these big monoliths, but actually um, there could be many individual teams and groups inside of a very large enterprise operating simultaneously on innovation. Um, when we think about uh, data, because you've mentioned data a few times, let's talk about data for a second. Um, you've got a lot of consumer data, um, and there's a lot you could do with that. Um, you know, could you talk us a little bit through around your thinking around data and data privacy? Um, how do you engage with the consumer, and how do you use data in general? So, um, appreciate any thoughts on that. Well, well, certainly, I mean, d data privacy regu regulations associated with that are the foremost of, of everything, the backbone of what we do. I mean, you know, we have mothers that trust our, 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 uh, our diapers. We have people that trust our things. Trust is what is about data. And, and P&G is one of the most trusted companies and has some of the most trusted brands in the world. So, so we take that very seriously. I, I think as we start looking at data, we, we do have a lot of consumer data, but we certainly don't have the information that, a, that some of these online, these, these digital companies have. They have much more information, which you know, people have voluntarily given, given up. You know, we use our data in, in, uh, that, that, we, that we acquire through similar means, through people opting in and, and only opting in in the appropriate ways that they, the uh, consumer is allowing us to use that data. It's all right. driven by what do you want. And a lot of that has to do with providing, say, advisory services. If you want, we have a, the Olay Skin Advisor. We can tell you things about your skin, how to make your skin to be a little bit uh, 
uh, more perfect or, or, or healthy. We have other, other types of advisory services and insights that we provide to consumers. Again, all done with your blessing. So I think that the, the role of a large corporation is we have to protect our, our consumers information. We need to make sure that consumers are getting value from the information that we are collecting. Yeah. And we need to be respectful and put it back to the, and give it back to them in easy to consume, intelligible uh, information. And, and that's what P&G does. I think that's what most corporations strive to do. Well, if it's okay with you, I'm going to take a question from the audience only because it dovetails perfectly from the uh, question I just asked, which is around data and information sharing um, at P&G itself. You know, you, you describe several companies under the umbrella. Is sharing information a challenge between the groups inside of P&G? And um, is this an area where you can gain competitive edge around being able to share that information? Well, I think sharing data in any corporation is, is a challenge. However, because we do take privacy to, so seriously that if you register, say, for a product with one of our brands, that does not mean another brand is going to have access to your information. Uh, oh, got it. So there's, there's discussions, there's call it negotiations that go on internally, there's understanding intent. Um, in order to determine what information can and should be shared. And even if things can be shared, and many times we feel that they shouldn't be shared because it's not what the intent was to do. So we spend a lot of time talking about this. We have a, a lot of our internal uh, lawyers involved with these discussions, along with the marketing and sales and other, other organizations, customer service. Uh, and, and periodically when we're out doing, uh, like any company, we do a lot of consumer research. Right. And these are all things that we research as well. So data sharing is difficult. Data harmonization is even more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are things that we are working on, but we are very much a data-driven analytics-based company, very quantitative in how we approach things. And, and we, can, we can only do that if we, uh, if we respect uh, the, the information sources and, and uh, use it appropriately. Great, well, appreciate that. And uh, absolutely, you've got so many trusted brands. Um, it's critical to maintain that trust. Um, if we can pivot a little bit and think forward about emerging technology and potentially how blockchain might play a role um, as one of the many emerging techs out, technologies out there, can you talk a little bit about what excites you? What do you look at in terms of promising technologies that are out there at the moment? Not necessarily applicable to PNG, but just in general, what do you think are potential areas of um, innovation and um, pique your interest? Sure. So, um, so I think it, we're, we're going to be moving more and more towards edge computing. It's been a trend. Uh, we have to defeat latency as, as a society. And even, even more so now that we're seeing what's happening. The internet has performed wonderfully. And the internet has done everything it was supposed to during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we have seen very few glitches. But, but we need to push out more and more to the edges, move to contact, more contactless inter interactions. That means decisions are going to have to be made, which means we need to be in a distributed environment. When you're a distributed environment, you start thinking about blockchain. Uh, but at, at the same time, I've recently seen some interesting technology and have been uh, over time watching it as it grows, where it's a blockchain enabled storage uh, that's GPU enabled. Mm -hmm. And it provides all type of in, in, in enhanced security mechanisms. It allows the owners of the data to make sure that, it, uh, that it's been validated and it has been, uh, uh, the keys are trusted and it perform, outperforms centralized storage. So you're going to see things applying, what I'll call that as sort of a deep tech example. Right. You're, going to, you're going to see things that happen on the edge with robotics and drones and this change the supply chain. That's on the edge example, especially when you overlay 5G on top of it. That's going to make things go even, even faster, both, but both the bits moving as well as the, the advancements we can make. So the, again, I'm very optimistic and, and very bullish on the, on, the, on the promise of where all these technologies are going to lead us. Um, the current world order is going to change and create the business opportunities. And this is where the entrepreneurs are going to have to step up and they already are. And they will come up with some fantastic new business models and business capabilities that these technologies will allow. Well, that's, um, that's absolutely um, fantastic. And if, if I may now ask you the question, since you brought up entrepreneurs and people um, stepping up with new ideas, and new companies, how does P&G work with entrepreneurs or startups or smaller companies? Uh, how does one go about engaging with P&G? Do you find them or they find you or how does it work? 
I think it's it's a little of both and probably two or three other things as well. Okay. Uh, I, I think you know we we have uh, we have challenges that we put out on a continual basis through through different different methods that we have and. We have people around the world that are always also scouting for new technologies based on business use cases that we're trying to fill. But at the same time, you know, you, you can always walk down, you know, if, you, if you're in the Silicon Valley or many cities nowadays, entrepreneurs tend to cluster in different areas. And if you simply walk down the streets, you can bump into people mm -hmm. and have some, have some amazing technologies. As well as what you're seeing is more partnerships that are forming and, and where entrepreneurs have some ideas, they, they are seeking out larger companies like P&G in order to test these ideas with, and then you may end up with some type of a, a joint venture out of these things. In addition, we have our PG Ventures Group, which is not an investment arm, but is really look, is charted with bringing new products and services to market, and they are actively out there as well. So, you know, uh, good ideas, startups come from everywhere and anywhere in the world, and you, you can't cover everything. Right. Um, money is a little bit more restricted, but you can do a lot less a lot more with a lot less money now because of cloud computing and other things. Right. So a lot of it's canvassing and a lot of it is just being a good citizen. And if you're a good citizen, people bring things to you and you bring ideas to others as well. Absolutely. Um, great to hear that. So um, when we talk about, uh, you know, you're working with certain companies and startups, that's great. There's different ways that you're doing that. But when you're thinking about attracting talent in-house, how do you do that? How do you get the best people into your um, teams and, and beyond? Um, what do you think about when you're trying to attract the P&G team um, to, your, to, your, to your world? Well, you know, P&G has, has been, uh, has a, does a fantastic job and has done a fantastic job for years of, of acquiring talent. And, and getting the right people that fit in with the, the P&G uh, culture and, and being able to move things forward. You know, the, the roots of the company, you know, is, is, you know, is in, in chemicals and substrates. And of course we have fantastic talent there. You look at the marketing people, everybody wants to work for P&G and work on one of the brands yeah. because you learn so much. The ability to rotate people around between different functions because of the size of P&G, the geographic experiences that you can have, because of, of again being part of a large global corporation, we have a we're a very very good good organization for for people, especially coming out of school to consider. You know, mm -hmm. when it comes to technology, I think that that the last two years, two and a half years have changed. Before much of our technology had been outsourced, we are now insourcing more. We're mm -hmm. bringing in people that are our engineers. We're bringing in uh, we have over a hundred data scientists. So we've been doubling down on technical talent. And we've been putting them on all kinds of interesting new projects or we're doing some very cutting edge work on IOT uh, in conjunction with Amazon. We're doing some things at Google that Google's never done before in the areas of consumer insights. We're doing things on, on advertising media and advertising tech all the way through to visual processing and inferencing through the data science group. So there's, there's no shortage of opportunities to look at very interesting things combined with a very a, a very well performing company that makes it a very good opportunity and a good good place for people to consider. Well, that's fantastic. It doesn't sound like it's going to be too hard, uh, or it is too hard for you to, to attract top talent. So that's fabulous. Um, we have um, a couple thoughts, um, and and people have brought up sort of you know where we are in today's world. There's a lot of change. There's a lot of flux, and um, PNG covers a global footprint. Uh, let's bring up healthcare and what that looks like because you have a lot of brands, you have a lot of products that fall into wellness and um, skincare and et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of healthcare, if you could talk a little bit about where you see um, PNG's relationship with healthcare and potentially just um, how you see the role evolving post crisis. Well, I think I can only touch on it a little because we're, we're not a. Um... We're, 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 we are very much concerned about health and wellness. That's, that's certainly what we're concerned about. You know, the products we, we have tend to be, you know, labeled as over the counter. So we're not in pharmaceuticals and many right. people use pharmaceuticals and healthcare. But I think the pandemic has really um, brought into uh, to light um, telemedicine, um, telehealth and things of that nature. And although uh, we don't participate directly in that today, certainly the physicians and other, other uh, advice givers are aware of the, the products that we have. I, I think I'd rather 
talk about the, maybe the future of, of telehealth and telemedicine because mm -hmm. these are getting into advisory services. And, and I would say over the last six weeks, I have had three appointments with my doctor all over telemedicine. Mm -hmm. um, I have been able to spend more time with him than I have been able to uh, when I typically when I go into the office. And in fact, proactively, whether this is because of the pandemic situation or not, he's actually reached out to me over telehealth to check on some things. Wow. So there's a, a lot of things that, that can be done. And if we see what's happening with the, the Apple Watch and how that's adding additional uh, monitoring capabilities and some of the rumors of what it's, there's rumors out there saying they're gonna be able to get blood oxygen level with Apple Watch 6 in September. I don't know if that's true or not. Mm -hmm. But as we see these devices, uh, become part of our lives from, from watches to other wearables to things that can simply be observed through visual camera pro uh, processing and visual images and things. This is all going to change. And certainly P&G and every company is going to, uh, is going to be participating. I think the, the one area that we are participating, we announced at CES this last year is we have connected toothbrushes and the toothbrushes can provide you advice on how well you're, you're brushing because we have all kinds of sensors from, from uh, uh, all kinds of tele tele telemetry, to telemetry that can be uh, taken from these things. And we can provide you on how your teeth are doing, how your children's teeth are being brushed properly or not brushed properly. That information can then be analyzed and provide you more uh, information about your health. So as we start connecting more and more of our lives, um, we're gonna be getting a lot more information and certainly P&G will be uh, playing in the, uh, the connected uh, environment as well. Yeah, no, um, we, the GBBC was there with P&G uh, for a portion of CES, and I will have to say a couple of the team members did try out that toothbrush and were amazed of what is being innovated. It's, it's pretty awesome. A little scary and also pretty awesome. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in, but I'd like to just round off um, more uh, of something about, you know, your experience you've navigated through multiple different crisis situations over the years. And um, each crisis is different. So we're not gonna try to say it's the same thing, but when you think about navigating and steering, you know, an enterprise through times like this, what do you think about the most? Um, what are the things that, um, uh, you know, you are concerned about, but then what do you think going out of it, um, lessons learned from the past? I mean, it starts with your people. I mean, if you're, a if you're a company, you know, you should be concerned about your employees, the contractors, you should be employed, concerned about your consumer. I mean, this is, this is why we're, we're on this planet is, is to, is to uh, make it a better place for the next generation. So it starts with people. So once you, once you understand and, and you can ensure that people are as safe as possible, that you can then start working on productivity. The question is, is, is twofold is one, how do you help your business and how does your business also help the community? That it's, uh, that it's part of as you go through the crisis. What we're seeing here is it's not so much the pandemic that, that bothers me. And in, in general, um, I, I'm hopeful that there'll be a cure. I was just reading about uh, something today that is not vaccine related, but a new approach that came out of San Diego for immunology uh, mm -hmm. that will potentially cut, the, uh, cut the, the, uh, the impact of this down to four days and your body will flush it out through antibodies. So this is something that was announced that they're having some very good success with. So I think some of the, the greatest minds in the world, and certainly people, various foundations are putting a lot of money up in addition to private individuals and the government in order mm -hmm. to solve this. But what's, what's more concerning is sort of the, the pending recession, which we're, we're already in, unemployment's at a high. I've been hearing some experts really talking more about a depression. Uh, again, we can't take a US-centric look at this, unfortunately, right. uh, but we tend to in the United States. But What's going to happen to the developing countries in, in Asia and Africa and elsewhere, this is going to have dramatic impact on their ability and, and their growth plans that they've had over the years, because this could set them back many, many more years than, than what could happen with a, a strong economy like the U.S. or China or, or what's been going on in, you know, in parts of, of uh, Western Europe. So I, I think that the, the lessons learned are we have to keep moving forward. We have to keep up hope and be be very much empathetic to everything that's going on. We need to make sure that we're running businesses in a, in a uh, reasonable and a reasonable way. Um, and we need to make sure that we're helping others. And, and as I see by talking to startups and others, you know, part of this is you have a lot of new technologies. There's a lot of things that, that can help me advance. But at the same time, I do have a lot of day-to-day -day things I have to deal with right now, but I don't want to lose track of you. So I've been telling them, look, 
it's better to look at doing something small. Let's get some tests done while we have the bandwidth and understand the, the potential benefit of this. Let's see if we can find new business models that allow me or other people to adopt this technology earlier or faster because we're going, we, uh, we know that there's a little bit of a cash crunch in other companies and P&G is, if you looked at our last report, we're doing extremely well, but there's many industries that have been wiped out such as hospitalities and airlines and others okay. that are gonna need, they're gonna need our, they're gonna need everybody's help and technology's help in being able to come back, but they may not have all of the cash to do a normal business deal. So you have to get creative in how these deals are gonna be done. So I think that uh, working together um, out of these things, and we've seen it with SARS, I even considered Y2K a crisis. When I go back to the Y2K days, uh, where everybody was worried that their computers were gonna shut down at midnight uh, and at the turn of the century. Um, but you, know, you get organized, you get lined up. A um, lot, of, lot of smart people. I think the, the term I like to think about is, is, is really a, um, uh, neurodiversity is something that really can come into play and help here. And I think sometimes we forget that, that we, we simply look at things are through a single lens. Yeah. The more people with different backgrounds that you have that you can bring together to solve a problem, you're gonna get better results. Take advantage of that, look at history, and that'll help give you some ideas of what to do for the future. Absolutely, um, I'm right there with you. And so when we're thinking about some of the new business models um, that will emerge or are emerging out of this, um, I think there's um, in the blockchain space, and I'm going to speak to the blockchain space. When I think about blockchain, uh, there are some criticism around um, these consortia or consortium that have been formed, and that um, you know the network effect that you need with blockchain to be truly successful requires these consortia or consortium. Um, do you have any views on that in terms of um, you know uh, engagement? It sounds like to me PNG already collaborates and partners with many others outside of its um, uh, boundaries. So um, it's, it's probably an avid partner. You know, we participate with a lot of different standard bodies. We participate in, in, in cooperate with research with, with universities. Um, we, we have a history of this. And, and so that, that, that history will extend itself into the blockchain space. I think uh, you're, you're, you're right here. Consortiums are gonna have an advantage. Um, I think we all believe in it. Maybe not everybody, but I believe in in open source from a technology perspective. And, and I believe that open systems do beat closed systems over time. Yep. Um, and you either have to open up the platform entirely or you have to open up the underlying substrates, if you wanna call it, and from, a, from a technology perspective to, to allow people in. And that's where the creativity and that's where the buy-in and the trust comes from. At the end of the day, this is for blockchain, this is about trust uh, is, is how I see it. And the question is coming out of this, pandemic, are we going to, tr who are we going to trust? Are right. we going to be trusting governments? Are we going to be trusting individuals? Are we going to be trusting uh, the traditional tech companies? I don't know. I, I think that there's a something to be said that, that brands such as P&G and others that, have, that you have trusted with various parts of your life for years, as I mentioned earlier, you trust mm -hmm. them with your child. That's a pretty good starting point to trust. Put that together with the people that manufacture baby formulas, that manufacture other things, you can have a nice consortium here that's really looking out for the interest and the health and wellness of, of, of society. Absolutely. And um, when we go back to some of the previous uh, presentations and the many talks that you've had, you've also mentioned a concept around um, the best practices trap. Um, can you expand a little on that? And do you feel like maybe some companies are falling into the same similar trap with blockchain? Um, I think there's a little bit of, uh, there's one camp that's sort of, um, you know, critical uh, enterprise blockchain projects at the moment. And there's another camp that absolutely believes this is the next multi-trillion dollar, you know, industry in the making. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about what you mean by um, best practices traps. Well, you know, I, I think that um, what, what, what happens is when it, whenever we go through any new technology, you end up going through a hype cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, people get excited about what the technology could do. Yeah. And, and there's always groups of people that, that hang on to the dream of, well, it's possible to do this, it's possible to do that. Um, and the reality is it can do that, but is it always the best? Is that the best option? Are you trying to force it? As the technology matures and as people become more aware of the technology, you, technology will, will automatically find its way into where it's best fit. 
And I think we're now at that inflection point where there's some very obvious um, areas where blockchain plays for the future. I think there's some areas where, you know, it, it could play there, but it may or may not be the best solution, but it could play there. And I still think we have people that are trying to force fit any technology, including blockchain into some areas. I, I think right. as we come out of this, this pandemic, new opportunities are, are emerging. We are becoming more of a distributed society. We can see that we no longer go to work, we work where we live. We're seeing that occurring already. We're seeing what's happening as we talked a little bit about telemedicine and telehealth. Supply chains are going to change. We're seeing a lot more local supply chain, uh, people purchasing locally. Are you going to be driving to big box stores in the future? Because people are worried about trust and personal risk and health and things. So I think that a distributed environment from supply chain initiatives to certainly financial, to certainly um, off to what's gonna be happening in healthcare and being able to do research in new ways. It lends itself to the, to the applicability of blockchain techniques, possibly combined with other technologies yep. in order to facilitate it and make it move faster. And we'll, we'll see in the coming months, uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of startups popping up that have some very unique solutions and some of them will level, leverage a blockchain for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I think uh, you hit it right, the nail right on the head. Um, we need to be pragmatic about where technologies could actually be fit and uh, solutions for those problem sets. Um, there's some questions here, so I'm going to go to the Q&A if that's all right with you, Alan, sure. and uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, we've got here, uh, you talked a lot about trust and P&G uh, is a trusted brand and has, sorry, lots of trusted brands. Um, how, how does the PNG infrastructure or the, the group help to keep that trust and build that trust with consumers? What, what are some of the big salient points of how you do that? Is it just time? I mean, what are, is it that you guys are doing? Well, I mean, you know, we, we have the advantage of, of being around for, you know, since the 1800s, right? So, so time has been on our side and time will continue to, to be on our side. I, I think it starts with the intent of doing the right thing. And, and if you're very intentful about what you do, um, then, then uh, and, and you, do, you plan to do the right thing for, for people, for, the, for society, for your company, your shareholders, th that's always a good starting point. From a, from a technical standpoint, we've been investing in the infrastructure to allow us to do this. So we've, we've spent a lot of money the last few years um, putting in place new networks, and, and I'll call it the base infrastructure technologies in order to allow us to extend our reach, extend our capabilities on a global basis and really prepare us for the next, next generation. So when the pandemic hit, we didn't have to worry about not having sufficient bandwidth. We didn't have to worry about, we were well prepared, not for the, necessarily for the pandemic, but we were well prepared for the future growth of, of P&G anyway. And it happened to work with our business continuity plan. I, I think on the, on, on the other side, the non-technical side, is that you know, it's, it's part of our core values. And if something's part of our core values, it's a top of mind in what you do every day. And from our marketing departments, to our supply chain, to our factories, this, this, is, what, this is what we're thinking of. And, and I think that through that, that enables us, it, becomes a, it has a seat at the table. The topic itself has a seat at the table on what we do with the executive teams. Right. So you have that coming from the top down. It's part of your, your, the values of the corporation throughout the, the organization. It's, it's, a, it's almost a thread that runs through everything. It becomes a lot, a lot easier. Um, we are a, a for-profit company, uh, but at the same time, we're also very socially responsible. We are also very much promoting sustainability. We're promoting, uh, uh, we're very much involved in, in trying to give back to the communities and others uh, for the future, because we will be here for, for many, many years to come. Absolutely. Great. Uh corporate citizen, wish more companies were like that too. Um, and there's a question here regarding uh, what are the biggest shifts to think about, uh, particularly within the context of a consumer products company over the next decade. So innovation inside of a consumer products company, are there special challenges that you need to consider? Well, I, I think we're, a lot of this has to do with, you know, we, we've moved through millennials to Gen X to Gen Z and you're, you're, you know, Gen Y, Z, et cetera, we're going through that and, and people are changing. Um, yeah. So, you know, if, if we look at this, 
where we're seeing people are, are, have been willing to give up a lot of their information. That's led to a lot of personalization, which mm -hmm. has led to more experiences, <coughs> excuse me, and the experiences actually start in your home. They don't start when you get to a, to a shop, to a store anymore. And, and they may never start in a store again. We don't know what's gonna happen with the pandemic. So, so I think that all of these trends of, of people willing to share information, these trends that we've talked about of, around being good corporate citizen and sustainability and things of this nature, which are very important to generations are gonna continue to, to impact us. When I look at it holistically, you know, we, we have a generation, the millennials, which really grew up without knowing any war. If you start thinking about what's gone on in people's lives. Now we have a generation of, of children that have grown up and are now gonna be growing up experiencing a pandemic. And this it was the last major pandemic was 100 years ago on a global basis. So all of these things, again, looking back to look to the future, yep. all of these things are gonna change our behaviors and how we get together and, and how we do things and we interact. Now, vaccine comes in, new antibodies come in, changes things again, but you know, it'll never go back to the way it was. Right. I, I was talking to one the CIO friend at a, at a corporation, it's about 5,000 people. He says they don't believe that they'll ever have a thousand people, more than a thousand people back in the office at any given time in the future. That's um, astonishing. Yeah. So the personal goods, personal products that you need, the consumer's goods that you need, where you purchase them and where you use them are all going to change. Yeah. It's just mind boggling to think of that. Um, absolutely. Um, sticking with, um, you know, changes in, in P&G itself, uh, when you're looking at innovation and investing in um, whether you go and buy a company outright or whether you go and partner and do a JV, whatever it might be, uh, when you think about the future, do you think that's going to change or have you thought about the fact that you're going to be uh, needing to pivot the way you currently invest in companies, whether it's through partnership or acquisition? Well, because or bringing it in house. Because we're so active across the board, we have a very large R and D organization that's aligned with our business units that are constantly innovating. We we mm -hmm. have our scouting organizations that are scouting our relationships, as I mentioned, with, with through PG Ventures with new products and services. Um, we're touching every you know, we're touching everything in every area. So I don't know that that what we're going to do is change. How we're going to do it may change. Be, be forced by. Uh, by just circumstances and also forced by new technologies that come about. I mean, robotics is going to be playing a more and more important role. We've already been in robotics for years, but it'll be playing a more and more important role in what we're doing. Certainly uh, the doubling down on artificial intelligence and ML is, 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 going, to, is going to create new opportunities. Um, getting inspirations from, from other, other groups that we don't normally get inspirations from um, outside of our industry, outside of our space because it's going to be easy to bleed over. And then just the consumers and, and consumer demands. I mean, if you think about it, uh, people are, you know, from a cleaning perspective, we're, we're uh, in hygiene, we're washing our hands more, we're involved in, in uh, doing more, more laundry, we're cleaning things before they come in the house. Many people are leaving their shoes outside the doors before they come in their houses. All of these consumer behaviors are changing. The question is, is it a blip? Or is this really a, a new way for all of us going forward? Right. And that will create new product opportunities, both digital as well as informational and in addition to the chemical based ones. Great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we have a question here. It's asking for your advice um, of someone if they're working inside of an innovation team inside of a very large multinational um, do you have any advice for them in terms of how to navigate and innovate inside of a large entity? Well, large, large entities are always, are always hard. And that, let's be honest. It's a, and, and, I, and I think you have to persevere. You, you have to be, you, you must persevere. You have to be willing not to give up. Um, you have to decide you're, you're, you're really taking on the, on the role of a change agent in, in, in many cases. And, and, and that takes a different type of individual, a different type of, of, of just a mentality about how you do things. You know, you, you have to always get involved and you have to build the relationships and, and keep the relationships strong individually, but you also always have to keep an outside perspective. You have to be willing to disrupt. We have a, a term, constructive disruption. And, and we need to go ahead and, and support that and we need to, to move forward with that. So um, it, it's really one of navigation, reach out and build your network, not just inside your company, but outside. 
Mm -hmm. um, be willing to share information. You know, I, uh, I always say this was, there was this, something that was, uh, was put out oh, 10 years ago or more um, and sort of talking about the roles of the Silicon Valley. And one of the ones that, um, that stuck out in my mind was, you know, uh, the person was telling the story. They said, you know, many years ago, back in 2000, in the 2000s, they had a, a meeting as a, a VC and they had a meeting that was set up with this, this kid out of Harvard named Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> and two different VCs and one VC decided to take the meeting and invest. The other VC said, I don't know who you are. I'm not going to even take the meeting. And I was right. told, look, who's going to be happier today from a pure financial return standpoint. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's building that network, taking those meetings, listening. It doesn't, it used to be, you know, you get together with somebody for 15 minutes over a cup of coffee. That's great. In this day and age, it's even easier. Just jump on a Zoom call with somebody for 15 minutes. Talk to them, help them out. It may have nothing to do with your company, nothing to do with, with anything that you're interested in, but pass on that expertise. Um, I had somebody just reach out to me the other day. I have no interest in what their company is doing. It's a little three-person company, but you know what? I think I can answer some questions and help them, and I'm going to find 10 minutes, and I'll probably learn something new out of that discussion as well. Wow. Wish uh, a lot of uh, other executives were like you. It's uh, pretty amazing and generous. Wow, thanks. Um, I have a question here for you related to digital identity. Is there a role for digital identity at PNG? Um, digital identity needs to be rethought in general. Um, mm. It's and, and again, this is an area where blockchain may be able to may be able to play. Um, it certainly is one of those, but it, it needs it needs to be rethought. Um, I think that we, we have to deal with um, device identities. We have to deal with individual identities. We have to deal with role identities at work, role identities at home. We all have multiple identities or maybe multiple personalities if you think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and somehow we have to be able to, to develop, again, I'm going to go back to the word trust, but the relationships. The question is, who vouches for who you are and what your identity is? Yep. You know, I always look at it as there was a, a startup a number of years ago that was trying to come up with a, a, a way to rate people uh, and, and, and to develop trust based on the value of the individuals, but as told by third parties. Mm. As I said, you, you can vouch for yourself, you can have a, a, a relative vouch for you, you can have a company vouch for you, but it's really what people say and think about you, which is who you are. And in that case, it takes in things that you do for society, things that you do in your community, things that you do in work in order to get to that identity. I thought it was a great idea. They were trying to gamify it, a platform, in order to make that happen. It, they tested it in some markets and in certain cities, and actually got some interest. So I think this whole digital identity needs to be rethought on a very, very broad basis and merge in all aspects of our lives and then we'll have a true identity. Yep. There's still a long road to travel on digital identity, but I think um, there's a growing consensus that it's one of the more critical gateways into how we uh, navigate in a digital economy. Uh, there's a question here related to um, looking at payments, um, not necessarily central bank digital currency, but you've probably heard the hype around uh, in the blockchain space related to central bank digital currency and stable coins and all of that. Um, does PNG look at um, innovation? I would say pro probably more relevant is on the payment side, um, using any kind of like token or gamification of payments, um, whether it's consumer end or on, on your invoicing side. I don't know. Well, so, so, I mean, I guess the, the answer is we're, we're looking at things. And, and, and the, the reason I say it that way is that when we had a, a recent, uh, we're getting ready to launch a new innovation program and, and we were trying to figure out what areas we were gonna concentrate in. And one of our senior finance executives said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd be very interested in having you look at um, payments and, and things and what are the innovations that are coming mm -hmm. here that we really need to be aware of and we should start testing and, and trialing. So I, I think every organization, typically finance organizations tend to be more conservative, which is, which is good for all of us, to be honest yeah. with you. Uh, but when they start reaching out and start asking for uh, to think differently and, and to see what's out there, um, that's a pretty good sign, um, both from our corporation, but also as other corporations are 
are um, looking at these things. Great. And uh, so we've got another question here related to consumer habits, I'm getting a lot of these consumer related questions, uh, if you don't mind. Um, but I think people are really interested. Uh, what's your view on um, how consumer habits are going to change in the long term? Um, will you be, you know, obviously changing your uh, product offering as well, for example, like beauty products and uh, various elements as people change? I would imagine the answer is yes, but um, maybe maybe thinking through sort of what kind of fundamental, and you've alluded to some of this, which is working from home, staying at home, um, will fundamentally change the products that we buy. But um, maybe you could add on a few more thoughts on that as consumers. I think we're going to, I mean, um, you know, the, the trend certainly had been towards personalization and had been more just to these experiences. Um, we're, I think, like everybody, we're trying to understand what the new world's going to look like. And, and we don't, we don't know. We, we keep talking about the, the new normal, but I don't think that there is a new normal. I think that what I've been saying is it's the next normal. Uh, yeah. Because there's going to be a, for a period of time, there will be something that we consider normal. Then it's going to change again. Then it's going to change again, and eventually we'll we'll settle into something for for an extended period of time. But you know, again, through our our R and D group, we were always doing a lot of consumer research. Uh, we're always doing uh, looking at trends from universities and things from a product side, trying to figure out what we can do. We're we're watching the trends in the markets uh, very closely all around the world. We see things that that are coming out of China that may make its way to the United States or Europe that make its way to the Middle East. You, you see these things happening all the time. So P&G is well positioned to do this. I, I don't know what's next. Um, I don't know how all consumers are gonna behave. I, I've been spending a lot of time observing people and talking to people, um, watching it's like everybody else's, the opening of certain states and certain cities and, and, and what they're gonna do, seeing what's been going on in Europe and Germany and Sweden and, and elsewhere. Um, yeah. All I, all I can say is I'm very hopeful that there's, that once the financial situation gets sorted out, there, the, the demand will return, the uh, individuals will feel more prosperous and the economy will blossom again. Um, gets back to trust. Absolutely, trust is the bedrock of all that we do. Um, we've actually, believe it or not, coming to the end of our time with you, but I want to uh, ask a couple final questions related um, to um, the future. I mean, you talk a lot about what you're seeing and your optimism for the future, which is fantastic. But I think what would be really great is if you could give advice to someone sitting there in the world somewhere who thinks they have an idea and um, they're gonna put it down in PowerPoint probably or something. Um, what advice do you have for that startup entrepreneur? Maybe it's not a seasoned entrepreneur, but someone more uh, junior and fresh. Um, what would you say to them? I mean, first, I'd encourage you to do it. You know, get, get your four or five ideas on the piece of paper first. Figure out which one you have most passion about. If you're passionate about it, you have a better chance of succeeding than if it's just an idea because you, you want to do something. So find out what you're passionate about. And then go test it. You know, it's, it's very easy to test things today. I was talking to some friends uh, about an idea that they have. And uh, we know what long term what it would take to build out. And they said, you know what? We can take this to another city in another state. And we can test this thing in a matter of weeks. And it's a new business model they want to try. And of course, they'll sort of we'll do what we call sort of the mechanical Turk. will be somebody in the background that's processing things. It's not all going to be, <laughs> be automated. But at the end of the day, they're going to be able to test this and they're going to be able to get the feedback. And if the feedback works and it, and it, it, it reinforces the hypothesis, then yeah. they can go in and start doing it. So don't give up. Test the ideas. Once you have some, some good, solid information, then go out and, and start uh, putting together your, your presentation of how you're going to convince others to join. Your presentation needs to be so you can attract investment, but also has to be so you can attract people to work for you because you're not going to do it alone. And you have to also have that presentation be able to attract customers because you not because you need a presentation for the customers, but you need a way just to be able to explain what you want to do in a very succinct manner. So really hone your communication skills. Once you have your idea, hone your communication skills and go out there and just follow your follow your passion. Great. Well, appreciate that. And I'm going to leave you with one final question, which is a different scenario because you uh, are advisor to a number of startups out there in the world as well as sitting on a number of boards and um, committees. Uh, for the cash-strapped 
worried entrepreneur who's got a bit of money, let's say they've got the seed, um, but you know, the environment's quite difficult. Um, what advice do you have for them in terms of just, you know, obviously they're trying to minimize cash burn, but these are difficult times for startups. They, they are. And I, I think that um, you got it right. I mean, you, you have to watch your, your, your burn rate. That, that's the most important thing. Get you, make sure you've got your finances under control. I've seen all kinds of interesting tactics that, that have been out there where if you have sales engineers or systems engineers that are usually working alongside the sales team and you, they have no work to do, put them to work, give, give their services away to somebody that's a, a prospect and say, hey, I'm not going to charge you for this. And in fact, I won't charge you for the software until January. That helps get helps the company get over the burden. Um, I say it's sort of a land and land and expand strategy. Go mm. in and get some of these small wins um, and worry about expanding when you know that the financial crisis that these companies are facing is going to be over with. And that positions you because if you if you help somebody now, they're going to remember that when it comes time to when you're going to need some help or when it's time to grow. Uh, I think it's a lot more personal. Uh, getting to know people on a personal basis. I'll also pass on a, a not to do, is that you know, many times corporations, uh, people would, would call up and cold call a corporation, which is fine because it goes to a switchboard, it goes to a, an, an administrative assistant or somebody, and it gets screened along the way to determine is this some, something of interest, which is good. Uh, what I've found out personally is people have gotten my personal cell phone number. Ooh. And started calling me, not once, but twice or more times, trying to sell me things. And all that does is, is it gets me very upset. I, I'm a human. I need time for myself. I, and if, if you get me my business phone, that's one thing. But if you somehow get my personal phone, don't, don't start selling. You should probably check and see what numbers you have in your CRM system. You should check and see what relationships you have. Yeah. And I've been hearing, so that's, that's one of my pet peeves. The other thing that I'm hearing that people should be cognizant of is, Yes, we're all concerned about each other's families and friends and the crisis. Don't overplay that. If, if you know me personally, it's, it's sincere that you're asking. And I'm not saying it's not sincere if you don't know me. But some people, I've seen more email leads in talking about the, the crisis and hope your family as well. And by the way, I can sell you this to, to fix this problem. Yeah. You know, let, let's, let's step back from it and, and realize what relationships you have with people and start addressing things appropriately and addressing people appropriately. Well, I am right there with you. I appreciate the do's and the don'ts because uh, that uh, I, I've definitely uh, encountered a few emails myself with a little bit of a quizzical, hmm, really appropriate. Um, thank you so much, Alan, um, for the time. Our hour, believe it or not, is up. We've been so privileged to have you and get your insights. Um, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And now I'm going to hand over to Joshua to lead us out.